We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. All right, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Herman Ponser, I'm from Duke University, and I study human evolution broadly, how our past uh, shapes our bodies and, and shapes our lives today. And I'm particularly interested in how our bodies burn calories, our metabolism. And the reason I've been focusing on counting calories for my career is that um, in evolutionary biology, uh, calories are fundamentally important. Calories are the, the currency of life. Right? Every task we do, from growth to reproduction to maintaining our bodies to uh, movement, uh, physical activity, as we'll talk about in this uh, workshop today, requires energy. Right? Calories are what make everything work, and every task requires energy. And not only that, um, but when we think about sort of the, the, where the rubber hits the road in evolutionary biology, life is, is basically a game of turning energy into offspring. So as we see with this chimpanzee mother here, who's eating while she's taking care of her young infant, um, and she'll be nursing that infant until it's about three or four years old. Uh, this very obvious and very easy to draw the line between the energy that she's taking into her bodies and the energy that she's able to, to turn into nourishment uh, for that offspring. But even when it's not as obvious and direct as this, our bodies are always calibrated and tuned to use the energy from our food to uh, promote survival and ultimately reproduction. That's what uh, evolution cares about is reproductive fitness. And so if we can follow the calories that a species burns, we can learn a lot about it. Energy is sort of fundamental to everything that any species does. And so when we look around the tree of life, right, we look at all the diversity of species that we find, we can think about each of those species and all that diversity as diversity in the metabolic strategy that each species has evolved to use to, to turn energy in its environment into offspring, right? And that calories perspective, that, that calories first perspective is um, really important, I think. And it leads to an obvious question then, as someone who studies anthropology and studies human evolution, which is how has human metabolism evolved? How has our metabolic strategy changed over uh, both the deep course of evolution of, of the group of primates that we're part of, as well as in our own lineage? And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about how our met metabolic strategy has evolved. And it's sort of a play in three acts. I'm gonna talk about uh, early deep evolution uh, within the primate clade, uh, the primate bough of the, of the tree of life, and how primates as a group seem to have changed metabolically. Then I'll talk about how metabolism and energy expenditure have changed in our own lineage, the hominin lineage, which is our branch of the primate family tree. And then finally, I'll talk about how energy expenditure changes in response to lifestyle and ecology in our own lives. Uh, within our own species, the species Homo sapiens. Okay, so um, we'll start then with the oldest question here that we'll talk about today, which is how has evolution uh, changed the metabolic strategy, the way that uh, we spend our energy across the entire primate group, okay? Humans are primates along with monkeys and apes and lemurs and lorises. We're all part of this primate order. And that primate order diverged from the other mammals about 65 million years ago, give or take. And so we are all members of this group 
the group primates. And when I started this work about oh, 10 or 12 years ago now, we didn't know a whole lot about how primates spend their energy or how it might differ from other species. Uh, we'd had lots of measurements of resting metabolic rate or, or basal metabolism, that's the energy that an animal spends when it's at rest. But of course, animals don't spend most of their days at rest. Most animals spend most of their days awake and active and moving. And so we didn't have lots of measurements of the total energy expended over the course of 24 hours uh, for many primate species. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'll be focusing on the total energy burned, the total calories burned over 24 hours for primates in our species as well. Okay, so there wasn't a lot of data on that. And so with some collaborators, uh, we started a project about 10 years ago, which we'll call the Primate Energetics Project. And we went to as many zoos as we could. We went across different human populations. Um, we went to sanctuaries. We even had some data that we were able to get from wild populations of primates. And we measured daily energy expenditure using this uh, technique called doubly labeled water, which uses isotopes to track the body's production of CO2. So it's a really uh, precise and accurate measure of the total calories you burn over 24 hours. And what we found was really surprising because we didn't expect to find huge differences. We thought primates would look like other mammals, but in fact, what we found was that primates are quite distinct. So here's a graph that let's walk ourselves through. Every dot here is a population of primates uh, or other mammals. So the gray is other mammals. Uh, green dots are populations of primates. And you can see right away here that as we get from go from smaller bodied to larger bodied, right, species burn more and more energy. So small species burn fewer calories a day than large species, just like we'd expect, right? Mice burn fewer calories than elephants, for example. Primates follow that same rule. So small bodied primates, uh, le little lemurs and lorises and marmosets, they burn fewer calories every day than big primates like gorillas and orangutans. And so that line goes up to the right for us too. But notice how our line, the primate line, is shifted below the other mammals. And that shift doesn't look like a whole lot here, but it's actually quite a big difference. When we compare our expenditure as primates to other placental mammals, uh, primates only burn about half the energy that you'd expect for a mammal their size. That's how big that shift is on this plot. Notice that the numbers here uh, don't go one, two, three, four, they go one, 10, 100, 1,000. When we plot things in log, log space like this, it can be deceiving uh, how big those differences really are. But it's a big difference. And just to kind of give you a better look at it, here we can look at uh, primates uh, compared to other mammals of similar body size. So if we look at ring-tailed lemurs at about two kilograms versus foxes, you can see how different they are, 217 calories a day versus 425 bonobos, our ape relatives, similarly low energy compared to a similarly sized mammal. So primates are really slow metabolism species, right? Our entire primate group is a low metabolism group. And that has big implications for our lives today. As we're, we're, we're part of this primate group that doesn't spend many calories. Um, and what we think the big implication here is that uh, by having a slow metabolism, um, we have a slower pace of life. So remember, I began by talking about how every task we do, from growth to reproduction to maintenance, all of it requires energy. And so if our bodies are burning energy more slowly, then it stands to reason that we're going to grow up slow, more slowly, we're going to reproduce more slowly, we're going to age more slowly. And, you know, we can see that in our own daily lives. If, uh, for example, here's a picture of my son and, and our family dog. Um, my son is nine years old. Right? And he's not even an adult yet. Uh, whereas my dog is 15, right? And in the later end of her life as a dog, our, our, our family pets, you know, don't live much past their teens because they live an accelerated life compared to us. Actually, it's, it's primates though that are the oddballs out. Primates as a, in general as a group grow slowly, reproduce slowly and age slowly. And we think this is because uh, as a direct result of having such a slow metabolism. All right, well, that's the primate group. What about our branch of the primate group? For that, we might expect to see differences in how we burn our calories compared to other apes. And the reason we might expect to see those differences is that humans have a suite of really expensive, metabolically expensive, energetically expensive traits. We have large brains and our brains, brain tissue is very energetically costly. Um, your brain basically runs a 5K every day. It burns about 300 kilocalories a day. Ape brains are much smaller and therefore burn much less energy. 
Humans also have larger babies more often than apes do, and that's energetically costly. We're more physically active, of course, and that also burns lots of energy. And so we wanted to know, how does human energy expenditure, how does our metabolism compare to the other apes? And for that, we focused in on energy expenditures, metabolic rates, between orangutans, gorillas, humans, and chimps and bonobos, which are on the same genus, the genus Pan, so we'll group them together. And when we focused in on those species, what we find is really interesting. Uh, humans actually spend much more energy every day than other great apes do. Even after we control for body size, which these data show, even after we control for activity level, our bodies just burn more calories every day. Our cells are working faster, burning more energy. And we think that has to do, again, uh, with this fundamentally human suite of traits that we've evolved, big brains, big babies, and active lifestyles. So humans are the high energy ape. And we don't know exactly when that evolved, when that change in our metabolism evolved on the, in the, for the 7 million years of our uh, hominid evolution since we branched off from chimps and bonobos. Uh, but what we suspect very strongly is that that change, that metabolic acceleration, uh, occurred around two and a half million years ago with the beginning of uh, our hunting and gathering uh, strategy. So humans and the genus Homo, in fact, before Homo sapiens, we've been hunting and gathering for two and a half million years. Hunting and gathering is the, uh, the, the strategy for the genus Homo. And it's an energetically costly strategy, right? You need a lot of energy to hunt and gather because you need big brains. You need more physical activity. And of course, when we look at humans today, we are also long lived and you need energy to be able to live a long time. You need to repair and maintain your body. Uh, and we also have large babies more often as we talked about before. So this suite of traits, which is fundamental to how humans are different than other apes, we think has been made possible by an evolutionary increase in the energy expenditure uh, in our lineage, our metabolic acceleration uh, that has allowed these things to evolve. All right, well, when we think about hunter-gatherers then, this raises the last question that we'll focus on today, and that is, how does lifestyle affect metabolism, right? Because of course, humans have been hunting and gathering for since before we were Homo sapiens, two and a half million years, um, but we don't hunt and gather today. And the recent changes in lifestyle with industrialization and urbanization uh, perhaps have, have led to you know, important changes in our metabolism that might even help under, you know, might lead to some of the reasons that we get sick. Um, and so this question of lifestyle and metabolism has become a really important one in our lives today. Well, to answer that, uh, my colleagues and I have done a number of studies, I'll talk about two of them today, looking at energy expenditures uh, with hunting and gathering groups and other um, small scale subsistence foragers across the globe to ask how lifestyle affects energy expenditure and specifically how physically active uh, small scale sort of subsistence lifestyles affect the calories we burn every day. And the first of those projects was this Hadza Energetics project that I did with David Reichlin and Brian Wood. The Hadza are a hunting and gathering population in northern Tanzania. Women gather plant foods from the wild uh, to share with the rest of the community. So they eat plant foods and animal foods kind of about 50-50 in terms of contribution to the diet. It's a physically demanding lifestyle as you can imagine. Women walk about eight kilometers a day on average, about 13,000 steps. Uh, men get even more walking in because uh, they're walking to, to uh, hunt for game, which you know, game is thinner on the ground than plant foods are, and so they cover more ground, about 19,000 steps a day. Uh, but both men and women are incredibly physically active compared to you and me and the rest of us in the industrialized world. Uh, if we put it here, if we look at minutes of what are called vigorous and moderately vigorous physical activity, uh, per day, the Hadza are getting about 120 minutes of moderate and vigorous physical activity every day. That's about five to 10 times more than we see in industrialized populations like the US. And so, you know, one way to think about this is they get more physical activity in a day than most of us get in a week. And so we would expect, of course, as we've all been told that, you know, physical activity increases our energy expenditure, the calories we burn every day, uh, we expected to see much higher daily energy expenditures with the Hadza adults, but of course, nobody had ever actually measured energy expenditures in a hunting and gathering society before this project. And so we went with this doubly labeled water isotope tracking technique, again, the same technique I've been showing you data from uh, earlier in this talk. It's a very precise and accurate way 
to measure the calories burned over a 24 hour period. Here's a hot demand drinking uh, an isotopically enriched water here uh, for our study. And so again, we expected uh, the Hadza to have much higher energy expenditures than we see in industrialized populations. But in fact, that's not what we found at all. So here's the data from that study. Uh, every dot here is a person, a man or a woman. Open symbols are women, closed symbols are men. The red are Hadza men and women, and the gray are men and women from the US and other industrialized populations. And as you can see here, the data are a little bit more cloudy, a little more variable than we saw with the species comparisons because there's inter-individual inter variation in energy expenditure. But we see the same trend. Smaller people, right, with smaller fat-free masses, your lean mass, smaller body size people burn fewer calories every day than large people do. Well, that makes sense because larger people have more cells, more active cells doing more active things. But once we account for this increase in energy expenditure with body size, we see the Hadza fall right in line with all of the other adults in this study. So men and women, women from the US and Europe have the same energy expenditures as men and women in the Hadza community. There's no difference in energy expenditure between the Hadza and industrialized populations. That was a huge shock and it made us wonder, maybe it's just the Hadza or do we see this more broadly? We have now checked this in a few other populations as well as a few other species. But what I wanna to talk to you about here, I'll, I'll talk about this one study that I think is really shows what's going on here. Uh, here is a, a study from the Schwar population led by Sam Erlocker. He focused on children's energetics. Of course, childhood energetics and metabolism and obesity are increasingly important topics in public health today. He was interested in whether we see similarities or differences in energy expenditures in children. And so he focused on children's energy expenditures from five to 12 years old. And uh, here are some of his data. So he showed, for example, that the, as we would expect, the Schwar children are more physically active than uh, children in the US and in Canada in this comparative sample. The children among the Schwar population also have higher resting metabolic rates or basal metabolic rates. And we think that's because they have a higher pathogen burden. Their bodies are fighting on average, fighting more bacteria and viruses and parasites than industrialized populations are. So every dot here is a kid. The blue kids are from industrialized populations, red are from the Schwar. And you can see, again, we, we do all of these plots against fat-free mass. The Schwar population has a higher resting metabolic rate. It's a lower resting metabolic rate for industrialized populations. And so higher activity level, higher resting ex expenditure, we might expect that they would have higher total daily expenditures. But just like we see with the Haza study, there is no difference between total daily energy expenditure with the Schwar kids and that with the US and UK populations. So it doesn't matter what your lifestyle is, it would seem, your body adjusts and is able to keep energy expenditures in check. And as I mentioned, this isn't just in humans and it's not even just in these populations. Um, we see this in other species as well. I showed you this uh, graph before. We have primates uh, here versus other mammals. But what I didn't tell you before is that if we look at the primate group, some of those populations are from captive zoo and sanctuary populations. Some of those populations are primates in the wild. And there's actually no difference for primates in zoos versus primates in the wild in terms of how many calories they burn every day. Um, of course, after we account for the effects of body size. And so primates, uh, non-human primates are also adjusting to their lifestyles, it seems, and keeping energy expenditures in check. So what this might look like then is, let's imagine two sedentary people. Uh, this person on the right decides to adopt a more active lifestyle. And for a while, right, their energy expenditure will go up. This is total energy expenditure, and we can think about it as being made up of activity and other, maybe resting and immune function and reproductive function and everything else. For a while, after they start a, a new exercise program, for example, their energy expenditures will go up. And, but then, as their body adjusts, uh, their body will make adjustments in this other category. We will spend less on other tasks, and we'll basically eat up and absorb um, all, or nearly all, of the energy expenditure that we are increasing, that we're adding to our daily lives with exercise. Now, that's surprising, perhaps, but seems to be a pretty widely seen phenomenon. It might also help explain why it can be hard to lose weight uh, with just exercise alone. Exercise in isolation doesn't do a whole lot for weight, and this might be one of the reasons why. Um, but before we get frustrated about exercise, I just want to point out that this less of the other stuff is actually probably a really important benefit of exercise. And so what we see is less inflammation, 
less stress reactivity, less, less reproductive hormone production. To show you what this looks like, here's the amount of inflammation measured by C-reactive protein. The percentage of people who have clinically elevated chronic inflammation, right? And this is versus how much they exercise. So the people who exercise zero to three times a month, four to 21 times a month, or more than 22 times a month. And you can see your likelihood of having uh, chronic inflammation, clinically elevated chronic inflammation is much lower if you are a someone who exercises regularly because your body, that's part of the adjustment that your body is making to exercise is spending less energy on inflammation. Similarly with stress reactivity, this is a nice study uh, showing stress uh, response and, and cortisol and epinephrine response uh, production, I should say, over 24 hours in women who are either getting, uh, this, this is a, a study to measure reactions and responses to therapy for depression. Women who only had talk therapy uh, produced more cortisol and epinephrine over the course of the day than those same women when they were had an exercise intervention included in their program. And so by exercising, and it wasn't overly rigorous, it was a sort of a moderate amount of exercise, by exercising a moderate amount, their bodies produced less cortisol and epinephrine. Those are the fight or flight stress hormones that are produced in response to stress. So less inflammation, less stress, less of other stuff that we think is bad for us actually. And these metabolic adjustments then are one really important reason that exercise is so good for us. And so we need to keep this in mind as we think about how our bodies react to exercise and adjust. Okay. Thinking then about our evolutionary journey as humans from 65 billion years ago to now, uh, I think we can sum this up in a couple of points. First, I wanna make the point again that your meta metabolism is clever and dynamic. It's a product of evolution, right? So it isn't some simple uh, engine that we can rev up or, or, or rev down. Um, it's responding to lifestyle in ways that are clever and dynamic to keep energy expenditures in check. We might expect that, right, from a, a clever product of evolution. Also, metabolism shapes our lives in important ways, right? The rate at which we grow, reproduce, uh, and grow older is shaped largely by how our body brings in energy and allocates it to different tasks. So metabolism really shapes our lives. And when we understand metabolic evolution, we can go a long way towards understanding the evolution of any species, including our own. And finally, uh, certainly relevant to this discussion today, uh, humans are the high energy ape. We've had a, an increase, substantial increase, 20 to 30% more uh, energy per day compared to chimps and, and bonobos in, in the amount of energy, the amount of calories that our bodies burn every day. And we think that that's been absolutely critical to fuel the evolution of our bigger brains, uh, bigger babies, and as we'll talk about more today, um, our increased levels of physical activity. So thank you very much. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to my collaborators and also a big thanks to the communities we work with around the globe. If you're more interested in the Hadza, you might check out the Hadza Fund to learn more. And if you're interested in the stuff I talked about in this, in this uh, discussion, you might check out uh, my new book, Burn, which covers this and a lot of other research uh, on the metabolism, uh, uh, the, on the evolution of our metabolism. Thank you.